Bibles, if you would please, to Numbers chapter 22. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 35. Numbers chapter 22, verses 1 through 35. Now, this is a long passage of Scripture. So I have a long passage of Scripture, but I don't think the message is, um, is that long. So I believe that we will be able to beat the Methodists to the restaurants today. So uh, this is a sermon entitled... Donkey Talk is the name of this sermon. Mm. This is a sermon entitled Donkey Talk. And the scripture goes like this. Famous story from the Old Testament. One of the strangest stories of the Old Testament. And so, what do we make of this story of Balaam and his donkey? And one of the most strange, generally the miracles of God, you know, have a logical reason. He heals someone or Jesus feeds someone. This, this, this story is, uh, is borders on the illogical. And so, have you ever had times in your life when God did something illogical? Though generally, God moves in logical ways. But from time to time, God does something so different that it can't be explained, that your friends won't believe it. He leads you to do things sometimes that, are, that go against the grain of common sense or common opinion. Now, generally... God moves in natural, predictable ways. But this is one of those times when God moves in a way that's so unpredictable and so unnatural that it made it into the Bible. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a notable miracle in the Bible. Now, it's up to us to try to discern why is this in there? What does this passage teach us about our relationship with God? How is our life changed and adjusted by what we're learning in this passage of Scripture, and, and what should we do after hearing this Word of God? Because the Bible says, be doers of the Word and not hearers only right. deceiving. Right. So, right. so what should we do in the light of this strange Scripture about a talking donkey? Um, I, I, I hesitate to preach on this because, because it, it, it is so unusual. But once you mine down deep into Scripture, you'll see that the Lord is trying to teach us three significant things. And I'll share that with you at the end of my message. But first of all, let me just read this passage to you. Then the Israelites traveled in uh, chapter 22, verse 1. The Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw that Israel, all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Now, they had just defeated the Amorites in battle. And um, so that this huge army of Israelites that were marching towards the promised land were striking fear in the hearts of the surrounding nations. And Balak, the head here of Moab, the king of Moab, was terrified in verse 3 because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, This horde is going to lick up everything around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab uh, at that time, sent messengers to summon, to summon Balaam, the son of Beor, who was at Pethor, near the Euphrates River in his native land. Balak said, A people have come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the land, and have settled next to me. Now they're on their way to the promised land. They weren't, really weren't going to conquer Moab. But he was just afraid they were going to come in. They were just going to, just because of their sheer numbers, they were just going to eat up everything in the land of Moab. Like an ox eats the grass. Evidently he didn't know about the manna from heaven and the, the way that God was supplying the needs of Israel with, uh, with water from a rock, how God was supplying their daily needs. And so he goes even farther away, up towards the Euphrates River, to uh, consult with this prophet named, named Balaam. And uh, so, um, so uh, he sends messengers in verse 5 to summon Balaam. And um, then in verse 6 he says, Now come, put a curse on these people, because they are too powerful for me. So Balaam, uh, Balak... Uh, the, the king of Moab says, these people are too big, they're too powerful. He goes to Balaam, this prophet, and says, put a curse on them. They're too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. So he thinks that the prophet 
has intrinsic power that whoever he curses is cursed, whoever he blesses is blessed. What he didn't know is the prophet is just is just reading what God's will is, and then when he says something, it comes to pass because of, of how God is leading. So the elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them a fee for the divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam, the prophet, says to them. And I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam, evidently that night, and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people have come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps I will then be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, Go, get back to your own country. For the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Balak sent other officials, more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, This is what Balak, the son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, Even if Balak, that king of Moab, even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now spend the night here, so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night the Lord came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but only do what I tell you. Balaam got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. Now here's where it gets weird, folks. But God was very angry when he went. So um, now, now he had just told him to go with him. But now God's angry when he went. So let's look at what God really t tells him. He said, um, since these men have, summoned, have, have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you to do. So he went with them, but evidently he was not going in the right spirit. His heart wasn't right. His attitude wasn't right. Maybe he had decided to sell out God. Maybe he had, had fear in his heart, and because of fear he was going to, so we don't know what happened, but something in his attitude meant that he was out of fellowship with the Lord. So God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the field with a drawn sword in his hand, he turned off the path and went into a field. Now evidently, Balaam... Um, it could not see what the donkey could see. You know, animals can sense things that we don't sense. That's right. You know that, that dogs' smell is like a thousand times greater than human smell. An elephant can hear things just, just wavelengths lower than what we can hear. A bat can hear things higher than we can hear. It even uses echolocation to fly. Um, a, a hawk can see ten times better than, than, um, than a human, and it can just dive down from a thousand feet and see a little mice mouse in a field. I mean, it's amazing how animal sense data is so much greater than ours. And so evidently this, uh, this donkey sees this angel with a drawn sword, and it turns off of the path and goes into the field. Um, poor little donkey. The Bible says Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. In verse 24, then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. So they're going through this vineyard, and the walls of the vineyard are on both sides, and they're going through this little archway through this vineyard. The angel of the Lord was standing there. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the poor little donkey again. Verse 26, the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place, where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it finally just laid down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. All right, then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to make you beat me these three times? <laughs> Balaam answered the donkey, 
You have made a fool of me. If I only had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now. But I would have spared it, meaning the donkey. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with Balak's officials. I pray God's blessing upon the reading of his word. It keeps going on from there, but this is what we're going to talk about today. The subject of the message is donkey talk. All right? So you know the story. You know, um, this king of Moab, uh, Balak, is scared to death of the Israelites. They're coming through his land, and he wants, uh, and he knows he's not big enough to oppose him, them. And so he goes to Balaam, this prophet, way up towards the Euphrates River, where present-day uh, Iraq is, and he brings and he sends for him, and he wants him to to curse the children of Israel. Balaam, uh, you know, thinks about it and prays about it overnight, and gets up and says. No, I'm not going to curse those people because God's with them. And even if you give me, when officials came back to him, he said, even if you give me all the gold and silver in your palace, I can't change God's will. You know, they're not cursed. And so then God says to accompany him back uh, to, um, to Balak's palace. Uh, he goes with them. Evidently his heart isn't right. An angel stands there to oppose him. The poor donkey tries to help him by veer it off, off the path to avoid that angel with the drawn sword by, by, by hugging the wall to avoid the angel with the drawn sword and finally just by laying down so that, so that Balak wouldn't get killed. He beats the donkey all three times. Finally, supernatural, the donkey talks to Balaam and says, Hey, I've been your friend. I've been faithful. Why did you beat me three times? You ought to know something's up. He finally sees this angel of the Lord and he, uh, and he repents. So why did God get angry with Balaam? All we're told is that Balaam did what God told him to do, but then God still sends an angel to kill him. Why? Secondly, what lessons does God have for us in this story? We've heard this story, if you've been in Sunday school, since we were little children. I've heard this story my whole life, but I've never really reflected on what it really means for me in the 21st century of the United States of America. We just remember the talking donkey. So um, what I want to do this morning is to introduce the major players in this passage of Scripture, and then I want to maybe tell a little bit of the story, and then I want to talk about three takeaways that the Lord might have for us, maybe three or maybe four. First of all, let's start with the donkey. I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up on army bases all over the world. I've never been around donkeys. I've never been around livestock. So I decided to study a little bit about donkeys, all right? Now, I know all of this stuff about donkeys is true because I got it right off the Internet, okay? So I know that this is true. All right, now, here's what I learned about donkeys. All right. First of all, donkeys were kind of like all-purpose vehicles. They were kind of like the ATVs of their of the all-terrain you know all -terrain vehicles. They were, they were used for transportation, for carrying loads, for grinding grain, and for plowing fields. A donkey was like an all-purpose vehicle. They were kind of like a pickup in Washita Parish. They were the old pickups in um, first century Palestine. They were highly dependable. They were very gentle and extremely friendly to people. The only drawback that a donkey has, according to the internet, the only drawback that a donkey has is their supposed stubbornness. A donkey can be stubborn at times. Now, do you realize their stubbornness is actually an advantage to humans? Uh, most of the sources that I read, and one of them, one of these sources has to be true with a name like wisegeek.com, so I know this is probably true. This donkey's stubbornness keeps these animals and their riders out of danger. And so even the donkey's stubbornness helps riders because they sent snakes in the road and um, 
And um, then according to horsechannel.com, when a donkey senses danger, they simply tend to freeze. They'll just stop in their tracks. They refuse to move. And so when they see a snake or when they sense danger. And so the reason for this donkey's reaction was, was natural. There was an angel of the Lord there with a drawn sword. sword. All right, now, now I did some research on what the Bible says about donkeys. And I was surprised at how important donkeys are in the Bible. In, they, they have a part in so many major Bible stories. Abraham saddled his donkey to take Isaac to be sacrificed. Genesis 22. Joseph, Joseph's brothers took donkeys with them when they went to get food from Egypt. Genesis 42. Moses saddled his donkey to go on his trip to Egypt to free Israel. And then, of course, Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem a week before he was crucified in order to fulfill prophecy that he would come and he would die for you. The donkey, it's, 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 it's the vehicle in Scripture that God uses to accomplish his will. Donkeys are an important animal in Scripture. Now catch this. In fact, they were so important that, first of all, do you know that, um, that um, this, they were unclean animals because they did not have a cloven hoof. They were unclean animals. But it's the, it's the only unclean animal that the firstborn offspring was the only unclean animal that God's law required to still be redeemed by the sacrifice of a lamb. Your, your firstborn male donkey had to have a sacrifice of a lamb to redeem it. They were that important. And it was an unclean animal. Yeah. So in other words, you couldn't eat it. Okay, how about this? The law required that a man's donkey had to rest on the Sabbath as well as you have to rest on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Your donkey had to rest on the Sabbath. Um, Exodus 22. Exodus 23. Catch this. Even if you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. You've got to help it. All right. All right. So th this is, these are important <laughs> animals. The donkey is only one of two animals mentioned in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's ox or his donkey. Um, donkeys were highly valuable to God's people and to God himself. And so that's my study of the donkey. All right, now, let's turn our attention now to the Midianites. And one of their kings, a man named Balak, the second character in this story, the donkey and now Balak. Balak was a troubled king. One day he wakes up and finds a whole horde of Israelite people marching through his land. This doesn't make him happy. He's afraid that they're going to eat everything in sight and leave the land desolate. He considers fighting them, but of course he's not strong enough to fight him. He knows he can't fight these trespassers in his own land, and he's heard about what they just, they just did to the Amorites. So he sends his messengers to find this famous prophet, Balaam, who is said to be connected to God, and he's going to ask Balaam to come and curse these Israelites so that he can have God's help in defeating them. All right, this Balaam has a reputation that whoever he curses is cursed and whoever he blesses is blessed. And so Balak sends his entourage up there towards the Euphrates River with a financial reward for his services, and he's turned down cold. Balaam talked to God, and God told him to stay home. Balak thinks maybe that wasn't persuasive enough, so he sends a larger and more prominent group of people up there to, uh, to Balaam and uh, with more payment for Balaam. And then at first Balaam turns him down, but then he inquires of God, and this time God gives him permission to take the journey to go see Balak in Moab. But only if he does and says exactly what God tells him to do and say. When Balaam actually does arrive, he ends up, and this is later on in our story, he ends up not only cursing the Israelites, he actually blesses them three times at God's direction. And then a frustrated Balak storms off and apparently never attempts to fight Israel again, according to Judges 11. That brings us to the prophet of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet of God. Now, I don't know whether he was a pagan prophet or whether he was actually a Yahwistic prophet that really knew the God of Israel, but I know he didn't know a lot about the God of Israel, but 
He was somebody that was in his own way was trying to connect to God. Um, whether he's a pagan prophet engaged in sorcery, whether he's a true prophet of God, uh, we don't know, but we know that in this case he encountered the true God. We know he wasn't a Jew. He was a foreigner from Mesopotamia up there near the Euphrates River. Um, he was not an Israelite. He was not one of God's chosen people. He was an outsider. But he was still a prophet of God enough to know that he refers to God as the Lord my God. So if he was simply a pagan prophet of God, you know, he wouldn't have cared if he cursed Israel. He would have just taken the money probably. And so, so something about this story says that Balaam connected with Yahweh, the true God of Israel, in a special way. And especially after his donkey spoke. So um, that's, um, that's Balaam. God used Balaam to make a prophecy about Jesus, by the way. In his third blessing of Israel, in Numbers 24, 17, it's not our focal passage for today, Balaam makes this declaration. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Judah, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. Mm -hmm. Many scholars believe this was a prophecy uh, one of the prophecies that the wise men were referring to when they came from the east, That's when they followed the star to find this newborn king. Remember they said a king will rise out of Israel, a scepter will rise out of Israel. So uh, at this point in the story, I don't have any trouble with what's going on in the story. But then you get this, this donkey story that's in there. While he's on his way to King Balak, at God's command, an angel of the Lord tries to kill him. Not once, not twice, but three times. What happened? I'm not sure. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say. Maybe somewhere along the journey, Balaam decided to sell out for money or through fear. Or maybe he just had a flippant attitude. But uh, maybe the money and prestige were just too good to give up. The only thing we know is that God said his attitude became reckless. So maybe he figured out that he that God didn't know what he was thinking and that God didn't know his thoughts and he was uh, he could fake God out until he got there. But of course you can't fake God out. Psalm 139 says, You've searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. I can't go anywhere. I can't say anything. I can't even think about anything without God knowing about it long ahead of time. So Balaam thinks he can betray God maybe without getting caught. We don't know. All we know is an angel is sit there to kill him. Now, let's, let's just think about that for a moment. Really, was God going to kill him? Do you think for a moment that if an angel of God wanted Balaam dead, the angel couldn't have gotten the job done? Or that God didn't even need an angel. He could have just sat in heaven and said, you know, just... No, there's a lesson to be learned. God can do whatever He wants. He wasn't there necessarily to kill Balaam. He was there, though, to teach him a lesson. And through Balaam, He teaches us a lesson because it's recorded in Scripture. What did, what did Balaam need to learn? Balaam needed to learn the same things we need to learn. Number one, don't mess with God. Number two, don't try to manipulate him or anything that belongs to him. Number three, fear God. Um, Henry Blackaby, I told the choir this one, one night at choir practice. Henry Blackaby says it this way. He says, uh, I fear God a lot more than I fear the devil. He says, a lot of people fear the devil. He says, I don't. He says, you know, a lot of people say, well, the devil's really getting on to me today. He says, I don't fear the devil. He says, uh, the devil can't destroy us. The devil can't do anything to us unless it's filtered through God's will. But he says in, in the Bible, God is constantly destroying his people. So you need to fear God. God can get downright deadly if he wants to. Balaam, Balaam learned something else. God's not a regional God. He's not just the God of Israel. That Yahweh that was there in Israel, he's the God of everything. He knows the hearts and minds of men. You can't Fake him out. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. We forget that sometimes. Baptist churches forget that sometimes. Churches where certain people think they can manipulate the congregation because they have enough money or they have enough power and prestige or if they have enough friends that can vote with them. It's really not the smart thing. 
Whenever do you know Baptists have these business meetings? You know these business meetings that Baptists have? And we have a business meeting and we vote on on um on what we are gonna do. I hope you realize this. When we have a business meeting, when you vote, I hope this this is very important. It seems like semantics, but it's not. When you vote, you're not voting on what you want or what your will is. When we vote in a business meeting, we're voting on what we believe God wants for our church. Amen. But a lot of people think, well, I'm voting my way and you vote your way and that's what the church does. No, you're voting on what you believe God wants for the church. It might not be what you want. You might want this, but you might think, but I know God wants me to. So you're voting on what God's will is. And um, so God, it's his church. It's his life. It's, it's not our life. It's his life. It's not our money. It's his money. It's not our church. It's his church. And God doesn't take kindly to people messing with things that are his. In fact, he told Abraham, those who curse you, I'll curse. Those who bless you, I will bless. Because Abraham belonged to God. I think that's the first lesson. Don't mess with God. The second lesson is more comforting. God will not give up on you that easily. God will not give up on you that easily. God went to a lot of trouble to teach Balaam that lesson. Um, if you or I are about to mess up, he'll try to stop us. If, have you ever felt like God sent obstacles in your way, closed doors, um, things weren't going right? It might have been God sending obstacles in your way to slow you down. Balaam is on his way to sell out maybe to King Balak. But the angel stands in his way and the donkey runs off into a field. He keeps going. He beats the donkey. And then the second thing, the angel swerves into a wall, crushes his foot. He beats the donkey again. And then finally, the old donkey just, the third time he encounters the angel, he just lays down in the road. He's in the process of beating the donkey one more time when God gives him a message from the mouth of this beast. And then he opens the eyes of Balaam. Three times, Balaam tried to reach his destination and disobey God. Three times God stood in his way. Why would God do that? Because God had not given up on Balaam. And he doesn't give up on you or me. 1 Peter 3, 9 says it this way. God is not slack concerning his promise toward us, not willing that any should perish, but for all to come to repentance. All right. God doesn't want to give up on Balaam. He doesn't want to give up on you or me. He's not slack concerning his promise to come again. He just, he just doesn't want any people to perish. He wants everybody to have a chance to come to repentance. And Jesus didn't give up on people, did he? That's why Jesus spent his time with uneducated laborers or people with little money or influence or tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. Jesus never gave up on anyone. He didn't excuse their behavior. He didn't overlook their sins, but he didn't give up with, on them. He spent time with them. He spoke with them. He taught them. He fed them. And uh, so that's the, that's the second thing. God doesn't give up on us. Number one, don't mess with God. Number two, God doesn't give up on us. Anyone can change. We've seen these videos how people have changed. Prostitutes, thieves, homosexuals, adulterers, murderers, alcoholics, drug dealers. People have been changed and things can change in your life. And God can do it if you'll follow Him. How can He do that? The blood of Jesus Christ. Those are the lessons we learned from Balaam's story. Don't mess with God. God doesn't give up on anyone. And then thirdly, God will do whatever it takes to accomplish His will. Even if He has to make a donkey talk, He'll do whatever it takes to accomplish His will. Okay, Greg Duncan, this is from like the 80s. Um, do you remember Don Francisco? Okay, the songwriter. Do you remember his song, Balaam? It was, it was not one of his album. All right, this is a song that Don Francisco wrote called Balaam. And the last verse of the song says this. That donkey still would not get up, but she began to speak. She said, Balaam, you're to blame. The way you beat me is a shame. Because all I've done is try to save your life. <laughs> the angel of the Lord appeared with a flaming sword in his hand. Balaam found fell down on his face, a very frightened man. The angel said, Balaam, you'd be dead if your donkey hadn't detected that I was waiting there to part your hair with my sword connected. 
Balaam then repented for his sin, and he promised not to act that way again. And I hope he learned his lesson about God's reward for greed. But you know, it's that tonky, talking donkey that's really strange indeed. Now that donkey's just a donkey, but she's still the thing God used. And that's the point I want you all to see. The Lord's the one who makes the choice of the instrument He's using. We don't know the reasons and the plans behind His choosing. So when the Lord starts using you, don't pay it any mind. He could have used the dog next door if He was so inclined. If God could use the dog next door if He was so inclined, yes, dog could use, God can use dogs, donkeys, fish, birds, and any number of wild beasts. He's the God of all creation. It's all at His disposal. God can and does use whatever He wants. But the ultimate tool He'd like to use is you. Amen. And that's, uh, that's Don Francisco's song, Balaam. And you know, for you and me, the most uh, intriguing promise that Jesus ever made is this. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do even greater things than I've done. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to the Father. I've always wondered about that passage of Scripture. We're going to do even greater things than Jesus? What does that mean? I've never fed 5,000 people. I've never, um, I've never uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. How can we do greater things than Jesus? He healed people. He fed thousands with just a little bit of food. He walked on water. He calmed the seas and raised the dead. Now, I can't do any of that stuff. But Jesus said you can do greater things than these. What, what greater thing can you and I possibly do than Jesus did? Catch this. The Bible, the book of Acts teaches us. Jesus of the angels, listen to this, never led anyone to salvation. The blood of Jesus saved people, but Jesus himself never actually shared the gospel and led someone to salvation. Now there's a story about Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, and Jesus appeared to him, remember? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Paul said, what must I do to be saved? And then Jesus led him to the Lord. No, he sends him to Ananias' mm -hmm. house. He says, Ananias will tell you what to do. Three days later, Ananias came and told Paul that his sins had not been washed away and said, you need to be saved and baptized. Jesus could have led Paul to salvation, but he didn't. He for this grand task, he uses this obscure man named Ananias. There's the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. An angel comes to a deacon named Philip and tells him to go teach that Ethiopian about faith in Jesus. The angel could have led the Ethiopian to Christ, but he didn't. He sent a mere deacon to do that. Uh, Cornelius, um, go, tell, go get Peter. He'll tell you what to do. Well, this is the greater thing that we're allowed to do. And you've been given a privilege. But you've got to realize that the only way that you can do what God wants you to do is to imitate that lowly donkey. Now this isn't scriptural, Susan, so you're going to get on to me on the way home. <laughs> All right? This isn't scriptural. This is totally what I think. I think that God, that God used the donkey because it's something that maybe Balaam trusted. Remember it said, y'all, you've always trusted me. I think God used the donkey because it was something that Balaam depended on. It was the all-terrain vehicle. And he used the donkey because it was a mule-headed creature that would do whatever it needed, no matter what the cost, even if it was getting beaten. And that's the kind of servant that God wants you to be. Amen. He wants you to talk to someone who trusts you. He wants to talk to someone, you to talk to someone who depends on you. And he wants you to be mule-headed <laughs> enough to stick to it until that person listens. Most of all, like that donkey, he wants you to stand in between that person and their judgment. And in closing, an atheist once told William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, by the way, read a biography of William Booth if you want to read a biography of a great man. He told this atheist about Jesus, and here's what the atheist said. It's an indictment to me. He said, if I believed what you Christians say, you believe about a coming judgment and that rejectors of Christ would be lost? I would crawl on my bare knees on crushed glass 
all over London warning men night and day to flee for refuge from the coming wrath of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I guess I pray that you'll help us to be more mule-headed about doing your will. Thank you for this example. Help us to um, not mock you, to believe in you, to serve you faithfully, and to be serious about what it means to be a follower 